Okay, here we go, folks. Thank you for joining us for today's program. I hope you are all doing well and staying safe. My name is Gary Sarkissian, and I am the Director of Education and Content at CFA Society Boston. In today's program, we carry on with the recurring theme of value investing by delving into a sector that has arguably faced the greatest of fundamental challenges, particularly given the pandemic, and has tested the patience of investors over the past several years. While the energy sector has had a stellar start to 2021, as the market anticipates a strong reopening of the global economy, the latter half of the last decade has been largely unkind, to say the least, to energy investors. In fact, over a trailing five-year period, the S&P 500 energy sector delivered a flat annualized total return compared to a gain of 17% for the S&P 500 and a gain of 29% for the red hot information technology sector. Of course, much of the lackluster performance has hinged on the one factor that can make or break energy companies, the price of oil. 2020 marked a historic year for the price of crude, which experienced wild swings that at one point resulted in futures contracts for West Texas Intermediate requiring sellers to pay buyers to take their oil away. Compounding the pandemic's demand side damage to oil markets, the energy sector also faces structural headwinds from renewable energy technology, an unsympathetic political environment, and disinvestment by longer-term institutional capital providers who are driven by ESG integration. Adding this all up, and it appears that the energy sector has been practically left for dead, or not. Perhaps investors are just using a different set of tools today for evaluating investments versus what they used a decade ago, emphasizing more immediate returns rather than long-term growth. Our speaker for today's program, which is titled Energy Outlook, Using Energy Investments to Generate Income in a Low-Yield World, is no stranger to the energy space. He has written extensively on the entire oil and gas value chain, covering upstream explorers and producers, midstream pipeline companies, and downstream refiners. In 2013, he was invited as a participant in Barron's inaugural MLP Roundtable, and in 2014, he was awarded Euromoney Institutional Investors' Patrick Fallon Award for his comprehensive research on the shale revolution. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today's program, Warren Pies, founder and chief macro strategist at 314 Research, an independent research firm he co-founded that combines macro top-down data-driven analysis with advanced AI and machine learning techniques. Prior to founding 314, Warren was the lead energy and commodity strategist at Ned Davis Research, where he built the firm's commodity-related studies, models, and indicators. His research combined fundamental, technical, and macro indicators to identify major investment trends affecting capital markets. He has been quoted by the Wall Street Journal, CNBC, and has appeared several times as a guest on Real Vision. Warren began his career as an attorney specializing in regulatory approvals for industrial projects. He earned his BS and JD from the University of Florida and is an energy risk professional certified by the Global Association of Risk Professionals. Before we begin this presentation, I would like to remind our audience that you're in listen-only mode. After the presentation, we will switch to Q&A. If you would like to submit a question to our speaker at any time during the presentation, please use the Q&A button within your Zoom webinar session. So without further ado, Warren, welcome, and please take it away. Thanks, Gary. Appreciate the introduction and the opportunity to present uh, to the CFA Society Boston. So as Gary said, today's presentation is going to uh, look at uh, the energy sector, but I want to kind of turn the energy sector uh, on its head a bit and use this as an opportunity to um, to use the sector to kind of in answer some of the larger questions facing investors today. So the, the presentation, the title of the presentation is answering the big questions facing investors, and we're going to use oil and energy to do that. At the end of the presentation or towards the end, I am going to uh, speak about the outlook for oil and, and kind of tie it all together. So as I see it, uh, when you say what's going on right now in the in the global marketplace, uh, what are the big questions that investors are wrestling with today? And two big questions that I think we can get some insight into uh, by looking at the uh, oil and energy space are one, what's the timing and magnitude and overall likelihood of a strong inflationary impulse that we will get on the heels of uh, all of the stimulus we've thrown at the global economy and, and the reopening that's, uh, that's soon to happen. And two, how are we going to, or how could we use energy 
uh, to generate income in a low interest rate environment while yields are rising. So these are two big questions that consistently pop up for our firm. And uh, I think that uh, kind of using energy uh, as, as, a, uh, as a guidepost can help us understand and answer these questions. So before we get into the energy specific stuff, it's important I think to kind of look at where we've come from and what's happening in the in the economy generally. So we can set the table for the first part of this presentation, which is uh, the inflation question. Are we going to get inflation and when will inflation begin to impact uh, investments, the Fed, and then ultimately into risk assets? So as we all know, we've had uh, a stellar vaccine rollout in the United States. Chart number one is, is a basic projection of where we will, when we will hit a uh, rough uh, herd immunity in the United States, which is coming up quickly. Uh, our projections based on CDC data and guidelines is that by uh, July, we should really have a good chance of uh, having full herd immunity in the United States defined as a 70% fully vaccination rate in the United States. So. In other words, we are close to a reopening of the economy. We can see already that uh, this chart here is your, your, your TSA checkpoint numbers. Your, and you can see we're, we're beginning to tick higher here. We're making new uh, pandemic highs on TSA checkpoint numbers. We're still about 40% below the peaks that we saw pre-pandemic. And when you, when you look at it, from an oil uh, perspective, this number, this gap that we're seeing in air travel is really responsible for the uh, vast majority of missing demand, which we'll talk about later in the presentation in the oil market. So this is key if you're looking at uh, the oil market and trying to determine when will we begin to see demand uh, normalize, get back to that close to 100 million barrel a day level. We need to see uh, global air travel not just domestic, but global air travel begin to pick back up and, and normalize. So why are we all so concerned uh, about inflation right now? And, and again, I think it's important to remember and, and kind of put in perspective where we've come from during this pandemic. And so this, uh, this experiment that we've run uh, during this lockdown period of universal basic income, more or less, has just uh, really uh, exploded personal income. And that's the, uh, the chart here on page five. We've seen a total deviation in the long-term growth rate of personal income in the United States from its long-term average. And, and that's due to the, the stimulus payments that we've seen during the pandemic. So it's created a uh, so many things have conspired to create a strange uh, mix of indicators, but this is one of the, uh, the most odd aspects of the pandemic. And consequently, we've seen, unlike other recessions in the United States history, we've seen consumer balance sheets grow stronger during this uh, lockdown period. So consumers are coming out of this lockdown in a, a record strong position from a balance sheet perspective. There, this is a chart of a consumer debt service ratio, which is, you know, has made new lows during the, the pandemic, multi-decade lows. And then if we look at quarterly changes to household net worth, you see all this is flowing through to household net worth numbers, which is also not just a consequence of the, the increased income due to stimulus, but the inflation of asset prices or the appreciation of asset prices during the, the lockdown period. So assets going up, personal income going up due to the pandemic. And what you have is a, a really strong consumer coming out of lockdowns. And so what do we see? What is, what is this uh, when we, we spin it forward? Historically, and that's what this scatter plot here on page eight shows, is that when household net worth increases as you move along uh, to the, the right on your x-axis, 
uh, you see consumption grow in the two quarter out period. Personal consumption expenditures generally grow uh, following increases in household net worth. And this happens with about a, a two quarter lag. We haven't seen that in the pandemic due to the lockdowns, but this is the relationship we would expect that when you see this kind of a record surge in household net worth, it should flow into your spending habits. And so once we get to that vaccination point in herd immunity, like we po pointed to at the beginning of the presentation, there is going to be a strong, a, a potential for a very strong consumer. Uh, and we should see PCE numbers really begin to tick higher. And we can spin that forward even farther and see that personal consumption expenditures lead inflation higher. So CPI increases about two quarters after PCE increases. And it's a little bit of a weaker relationship than we saw on the previous chart, but there is a relationship there. You do see that you tend to get rising in inflation following periods of rising consumption. And so this is uh, kind of setting the table for, will we have inflation, enough inflation where investors should really begin to worry about it as a risk to risk assets uh, moving forward? Page 10 is a, again, uh, part of what's feeding into this inflation fear. It's federal government outlays versus receipts. We've seen, um, the deficit has blown up due to you know more than $5 trillion of stimulus spending. We now have uh, 2.25 trillion spread over eight years of um, potential infrastructure spending that's on the table. And many people in the uh, majority party are looking for a, a bigger infrastructure bill. So one way or another, it looks like we're going to have, uh, a, a, have be running a, a larger deficit structurally for the next few, years, potentially for the next decade, depending on how growth goes. Uh, you know, historically, you see federal spending as a percentage of GDP stay around 20%. Well, in 2020, that number jumped above 30%. It was the highest we've seen since World War II, uh, adjusted, adjusted for inflation and the size of the economy. And the projections from the Congressional Budget Office are that we will get uh, numbers above 25% to 30% going through the next uh, 2021 and 2022, depending on the size of the you know next stimulus packages, which there are supposedly there are more coming, and then uh, the infrastructure package. So we could be running a 30% government spending uh, as a percentage of GDP for the next uh, few years potentially, given those numbers. And so again, this feeds into the the fear for potential inflation down the road. Of course, uh, bank deposits have grown. Liquidity is uh, abundant in this economy. The Fed has been the other aspect of the uh, potential inflation equation and to backstop the economy. It's been from vaccine rollout to Fed policy to fiscal response. It's been quite a, uh, an epic response to the, to the pandemic. And so all of that stuff flows through. It's, there's, there's a positive, but just like we've seen with, with everything, there's a, always a side effect. So will inflation be one of the side effects that we have to worry about here? And you can see on this chart, page 12, Google Trends for the search term inflation have, uh, have spiked up in, uh, in recent months. Uh, it's on everyone's mind. This is the, the big question. So on page 13, let's begin looking at uh, market-based measures of inflation expectations. And something I've said is I, I believe that um, when you study inflationary periods, that inflation is always and everywhere a psychological phenomenon on some level there has to be a psychological shift and that shift uh, shows up as ex expectations. And so uh, when would we begin to get concerned? When would, and when we say we would get concerned, when would the Fed begin to get concerned is really the ultimate question you should be asking yourself because as investors, uh, we're not trying to determine the right level of inflation for society 
in general, we're just trying to understand when is inflation going to be impacting our investments through um, a tightening of monetary policy. At least that's how I'll frame it for this presentation and for the purposes of my clients. Uh, so looking at inflation expectations, there there is there we are beginning to see um, increased uh, inflation being priced in at different market based measures. Uh, this chart here is looking at uh, tips break even inflation. Uh, we're seeing uh, two and five year moving higher but more rapidly than ten year recently. So the market at this point in time is saying through break evens uh, that we uh, should expect uh, near-term inflation to be a little higher than uh, structural long-term, which uh, I think makes sense when you consider all the factors we laid out at the beginning of this program, but we're, we're breaking out across every duration higher. CPI swap rates are telling us the same story, every duration breaking higher. So we're beginning to get inflation expectations uh, Inflation expectations are rising. We're beginning to get a uh, an underlying concern in the market that inflation will be moving higher in the future. So we laid out the case and, and kind of the reasoning for for why we would potentially be concerned about inflation uh, moving forward. Uh, strong consumer balance sheets, pent up demand, literally. Uh, like an economy flush with liquidity, all of this has uh, in potential uh, psychological shift into a higher inflation expectations by market participants and by consumers in general. So the question we have is, what is there anything that we can point to to offset this? And I think the first thing, and this is where you can start considering oil, the first thing to think about is the slack that we see in the economy. So. The real output gap is still um, uh, sub 2%. So there's a lot of slack and, and room for potential economic growth in the economy. And in our study show that it's historically at least difficult to see CPI rising uh, meaningfully when we get, uh, when we have this much slack in the economy. And this shows up also in in the labor markets, which is obviously a broad measure of inflation. You have um, still a ways to go before we get back to employment levels we saw pre-pandemic, uh, labor participation rate, U6 unemployment, all of those numbers are quite um, divorced from their pre-pandemic levels. So again, there's slack in the economy to absorb at least the initial stages of this reopening boom. And uh, that should, it should cap inflation uh, in the near term. Looking at, and getting, getting a little more, putting a little more of a fine point on the inflation question, the Fed has kind of made a subtle shift in their, in their policy guidelines here in the last in the last year, in August of last year, they came forward and said that we're gonna more or less allow for a catch up inflation. During these periods when we've seen uh, inflation run sub 2%, which is the target uh, for a sustained period of time, we're gonna, let, uh, we're gonna let inflation run hotter than 2% for, uh, for a while after that in order to get back to our target base. So we created this chart where we basically started from 2008 and used this, um, the, the blue line is the Fed's linear 2%. If we were perfect as a, as a, as a, at targeting inflation and we had CPI growing at 2% annually, that's your target number. And so you can see that, and this is where we start looking at oil. You can see that in 2014, 15, when oil collapsed, we had this sharp deviation from of, of inflation from expectations and that's highlighted on the chart here and we haven't really ever gotten back to trend inflation since that point and a big part of that is oil uh, oil and we'll show this later in the presentation is has historically been really tightly linked to inflation numbers and so unless you get a strong oil bull market it's historically been difficult to get this kind of movement in cpi or in inflation broadly speaking 
The next part of the chart, we, we take the blue dashed vertical line and put it where we are currently. And then we're drawing in just as a thought experiment uh, that if the Fed were to look at a chart like this or consider the chance for catch up inflation before they remove, we take a 3% measure uh, and a 4% measure of inflation, which are pretty aggressive assumptions because we're, we're taking it from today if CPI were just to start leveling up at 3 and 4%. And you can see at 4% inflation, we get the, the Fed would get to their hypothetical target line as we lay it out in this chart. And again, this is just kind of a good thought experiment. It's not, this is not made explicit by the Fed, but I think it's a really good framework for us. You can see it at 4% inflation, we get to the Fed's uh, target at around two years from now. And at 3% inflation, it would be about five years. So if we went back and considered the uh, break-even rates that we're seeing the market price in, they're somewhere around two and a quarter to 2.5% right now. Two-year break-evens are a little higher than that. That tells us that we actually probably have about 100 basis points still to move up before in, those, those in, in the nearer term inflation expectations, at least, before uh, potentially the Fed would consider making any moves or adjusting policy. I think that the, that's what they have signaled with their, with their most recent August amendment to their inflation targeting. So I think it's an important kind of thought to, to really uh, commit to memory that there's going to be this period where inflation runs hot. And so we see a lot of people worrying about inflation expectations. On, and on the short end, I think it would be, you would need really aggressive increases and in break-evens before the Fed started taking action. Another thing we've looked at when it comes to uh, inflation during the pandemic is that it's been uh, really uh, an uneven kind of set of numbers when you look under the surface. And so this is a bar chart looking at the most inflationary components of the CPI on the right-hand side. Left-hand side is the most deflationary components of the CPI. During the pandemic, you know, you get stories here or there about different shortages, supply chain disruptions. You've seen, um, for instance, recently there's been a ketchup shortage, and so ketchup prices are going up. And you know, I, I've seen inflation uh, inflation worries, and they point to these anecdotal stories of supply chain disruptions. And really, what you've seen is a, a, it's a pandemic. It's an odd market. We're seeing uh, times where uh, your components of the CPI are experiencing really rapid inflation growth, whereas others are undergoing rapid deflation. It's a strange period for the world and for uh, prices generally. And then we can really, um, we really can drive that home by looking at the median correlation of all the CPI components to the broad CPI index. That's this chart here. And for the first time, ever that median correlation has moved deeply negative. So again, what we're doing is you picture we're doing uh, running every component of the CPI, over 200 of them, uh, running a 36 month correlation to that broad index and then cross-sectionally taking the median. That's what we plot here. And you can see we're now deeply negative. So the average CPI component is not moving with the index. It's just, in my view, this is, is a, it's a relic of the pandemic and the fact that we've seen supply chains, global supply chains upended during this time period. And so this is, um, this tells us we should maybe not trust our eyes so much when we see uh, anecdotal numbers spiking up in supply chain worries, because at the end of the day, the Fed can't really tighten monetary policy to uh, fight problems in the global supply chain doesn't make sense. Could, you know, ask yourself a, a simple rhetorical question. Could the Fed have done anything to solve the ketchup shortage by adjusting monetary policy? And the answer is no. The ketchup shortage is due to, I suppose, more takeout orders, which has caused more uh, deliveries of pack, ketchup packets, which are <laughs> driving up the price of ketchup. So what can we do? How can we use oil to actually add to our conviction that inflation is not a real near-term concern? And number one is to recognize how closely linked oil has been with inflation historically and with inflation expectations. So as we take those inflation expectations and try to map them on to what would actually move the Fed off of their, off of their um, 
policy uh, objectives, we would need to see, I think, like we said, uh, another potentially 100 basis points of, uh, on, on, on break evens, for instance. And oil prices have moved historically really tightly with, with break evens. And so as we've seen oil prices move up 60% since the vaccine announcement, we've seen inflation expectations in the form of break evens and CPI swap rates. And this is a 10 year duration of both. Uh, move higher as well. So this implies that in order to get another leg higher in inflation expectations, you would need another leg higher in crude oil prices. So we need to go from 60 something Brent to 80 something Brent, let's say. And so the question is, is that likely? Well, number one, I would say before we get to that, uh, number one, I would say we, have to recognize the oil market is still an impaired market. We are, this is a chart here on page 21 of oil demand. We're still uh, almost 5%, 5 million barrels a day of oil demand offline uh, compared to pre-pandemic levels. And the price has gone up and some of the indicators we'll look at later in the presentation indicate a tight market for crude oil, but it's important to remember how we got there. It's from OPEC crunching down on supply and really tightening the market. And so we've gotten, you know, backwardation in the curve and we have inventory numbers that look good. But at the end of the day, to take those, the, the increase in oil prices and say this is a sign of a tight market at this point that's inflationary, I think you are jumping the gun. And, and so we have slack in the economy, we have slack in the labor market, and we also have slack in the crude oil market. So all of these things, and I think it's maybe less appreciated in the crude oil market, these things are shock absor absorbers for when the economy opens if, uh, if you're worried about inflation. So the bottom line is I think when you look across that, the slack that's left in the economy and the crude oil market, it's unlikely for us to get um, inflation high enough to make the Fed, to move the Fed off of their, their current policy outlook uh, anytime soon. The second big question that we could look at and try to uh, get a better answer for with, uh, by looking at oil and energy markets is energy's role in generating income. How can we generate income during a, in a low interest rate environment uh, using uh, energy sector equities? So again, to set the table, long-term government bonds in the midst of their, their most uh, dramatic drawdown in uh, on record basically going all the way back to the uh, 80s and so bonds long-term bonds anything with a long duration has really suffered during the last quarter or so while we've had this reflation rally putting the move uh in rates in perspective is uh this chart so what I'm tracking here is consecutive weekly increases in the 10 year interest rate on the top clip and consecutive weekly increases in the, in the yield curve. So steepening yield curve. And what we got here recently, we had uh, last week was an end to this streak, but we had seven consecutive weeks of higher 10 year rates and a steeper yield curve. And so it's a very rare occurrence here what's happening now you don't get that very often if you scan your eye across this chart this goes to 2018 you can see that there's no other occurrence here from uh, 2018 forward where both of these happen for seven weeks in a row if we move the chart uh to a longer term perspective all all the way back to the 70s you can see again and i've drawn a, a line in across on each of these clips showing where the seven week mark is it was, it's quite rare to get a seven week period where you have an increasing yield curve and increasing rates at the same time. And so you can go back, you can see that we got um, an occurrence back in 2009, and then you have to go all the way back into the nineties to get another, uh, another similar instance. And so the, the message here is that this has been a, a really unprecedented move higher. It's a with this the with the curve steepening during the move uh, higher in rates. 
we, we read this as really a function of underlying economic strength. And this has really been um, what's driving what I'm calling the duration heuristic, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Again, putting that, just before we talk about that, the, the driver here, you know, rates can be driven in a, uh, by a, a, the different things at different times. Looking at the curve steepening and rates moving higher, you can see pretty clearly, clearly during this, this cycle that what's moving rates is this reflation trade. So copper gold is a good kind of proxy for the reflation trade versus the 10 year, you can see that it's been copper gold leading the 10 year higher during this reflation uh, move in rates. And something uh, as we start looking into how can we navigate this period as, as potential income investors, what, what can you do when rates are increasing, but they're ultimately increasing from a low level and you want to generate income for your portfolio. So I think the energy sector does provide a, an interesting option. It does provide, at least it should have a, it serves an interesting uh, place in an income generating portfolio. So this is something I've been looking at since uh, really 2019. And I've been thinking about what caused the energy sector in April of 2019 to become for the first time ever, the highest yielding sector in the entire market. So energy became the highest yielding sector in April, 2019, and that spread over the next sector, next closest sector, the utility sector now has, maintained, has remained really steep through the pandemic. There's been a little bit of closing of it, but, but ultimately energy is by far the highest yielding sector at this point in time. And, and my thought is that the energy sector, this was the, back in 19 and the 20 before the pandemic, there had become a short duration sector. And so to watch the pandemic wash through the market, it was really a, a nice, it, it kind of justified the thought experiment I was running in my head. And the, the short duration in this case, we're, we're saying energy is, is a, the net present value of these traditional hydrocarbon assets is really grouped in near-term cash flows. So when you shift economic growth around, near-term economic growth around, and really, uh, it, if you lock the economy down and near-term economic growth falls off a cliff, it has an outsized downward impact on, on energy. Alternatively, if you're gonna have a boom, like uh, we laid out the beginning of the, the presentation, as uh, the energy sector would, would benefit with, uh, with the increase, the rapid increase in near-term economic growth. And the other side of that, as you look at the sector and, and think about uncertain terminal values and a, an uncertain future and a short duration asset, you're going to get less of your valuation based off of long-term interest rates. So long-term interest rates rising hurt sectors like tech that have uh, really a big part of their, their valuation can be derived from uh, the low level of long-term interest rates. And so you have this kind of long duration in tech and short duration in energy as two poster childs of this, what I'm calling the duration heuristic. And you can start to see that now coming through in the data. And so this chart here uh, on page 28 is, uh, is, a, is our way of, of visualizing the duration heuristic and one of the ways to do it at least. The purple line is, is energy's connection or beta to the 10 year rate, 10 year interest rates. And we have the blue line is tech and you've just seen this huge divergence between the two. Usually they kind of move in this uh, around that zero bound, not a whole lot of explanatory power there, but recently, especially during the pandemic, you've seen this move higher. It's because really what's behind, it's not that energy benefits nothing, no, no, uh, risk asset benefits when rates are higher, so to speak, from a valuation perspective. But what it's telling you is that energy is keen off of that near-term economic growth. All their important cash flows are bunched up in the near term. You can see also the fact that energy has become a short duration asset in the way the management teams are beginning to manage capital and what ultimately the investor base is demanding out of energy stocks. So the purple line here reallocated uh, dividends and CapEx in the energy sector back to uh, 100 
in the beginning of 2016. And you can see that uh, energy sector total dividends have more or less been flat during this uh, five-year period, but CapEx has fallen off a cliff. And that's the blue line. So management is can maintaining dividends and slashing CapEx. And this is a direct result of what clients, investors are demanding. Investors are demanding uh, the near-term return of capital and they aren't wanting to fund, they no longer want to fund these long-term growth projects. And so the upshot is CapEx is falling off a cliff, but dividends are coming in strong. And this is gonna be the, the roadmap that I think, uh, the roadmap to success for energy stocks as we move forward in, into this new world with energy as uh, firmly in the short duration camp. So how would we use that knowledge to select winners within the energy space? Well, we've created a factor, what we call sustainable dividend yield. And this is just more or less a, a simple measure of uh, your cash inflows divided by your cash outflows times your dividend yield. And so the, the bottom line is we're trying to adjust the, the payout that you get from these energy stocks uh, for a sustainable payout. You know, and we're taking all of CapEx as, uh, and considering all of CapEx as an outflow. If you're familiar with pipeline companies, a lot of times you'll see distributable cash flow, which uses only maintenance CapEx um, and, doesn't, and it doesn't include growth and maintenance CapEx. That's not a non-GAAP number. And so ultimately we, we throw all the GAAP numbers in there and just say, okay, you're spending this much, you're, you're paying out this much, you're taking in this much, how much can you sustain going forward if this is what investors are really looking for? And this has been a factor that's worked extremely well in the energy space. Um, the bottom clip is uh, we broke the sector into two, uh, two halves since 2010. Uh, the, uh, the, the top half of energy stocks by sustainable dividend yield have been um, outperforming. Now we've had a break in that a little bit during this, this reflation rally. That's not going to last, in my opinion. I think this is going to revert back to, you can already see kind of a, a beginnings of a move higher where the more stable, sustainable payers of dividends in the energy space are going to be the winners within energy. We took this kind of knowledge and this our outlook on uh, energy and our thesis that energy is a short duration asset and is now probably going to remain the highest yielding asset within the within uh, within the highest yielding sector within the market, and we added it to our yield optimizer model, and that's what we're looking at on page 31. The yield optimizer is a model that we created at 314. We use proprietary trend uh, metrics along with uh, hierarchical risk parity, which is a concept coming out of machine learning to combine 13 different income producing assets. And the idea is to try to generate yield in a, in a, in a low yield environment by shifting through these assets, finding the most uh, attractive relative mix. Uh, energy's in there. It's not traditionally thought of as an income producing asset, but I think it will uh, increasingly become thought of as an income producing asset and more importantly, a short duration income producing asset. I think getting duration exposure, long duration exposure is easy. You get it in big tech, you get it through bonds. Uh, it, it's, it's much harder to find short duration exposure. Uh, in other words, uh, yield-based assets that don't immediately fall apart when you get higher long-term rates. And, and I think that's what you have in energy. It's going to key off of near-term economic growth and can sustain its, uh, its it has enough of a, an income or yield gap premium to uh, maintain, to st stick in there even during periods where rates rise some. So it makes sense to add energy into your income portfolio and, and treat it as kind of that short duration exposure. So let's wrap this up by looking at oil. What is, uh, what's our outlook for oil like going through uh, the rest of the year currently and, and how do we look at oil? Uh, really, like we said, if energy is a short duration asset, oil is the shortest duration asset because there's really, it's a, it's a near term economic input. There's no, you get no value from storing it and, and holding it like um, other commodities. It, it has to be consumed. And so as that, as given that it's its nature, 
I, I think it's important to think of it through that same duration heuristic. But from, um, from our framework, we look at first positioning. Uh, we've been warning about positioning in the oil market for months now. The chart we're looking at on page 33 looks at managed money short positions as a percentage of, of total open interest. And uh, really, we've been running uh, ever since the vaccine announcement. You can see that uh, we've really run all the short positions out of the market. And now we have uh, a lot of longs, not a lot of shorts. And this is generally a vulnerable state for oil. So when you have this kind of positioning lopsided on the long side, it makes oil vulnerable to stiff pullback. So that's where we are right now. Um, and it would make this part of the equation makes us cautious on oil. So we look at positioning. We also look at the physical market when we're constructing our oil framework. One of our um, one of the ways we, we judge the physical market is through curve shape. And so contango, meaning that front months are trading below farther out months, backwardation is the opposite of that. And we can measure that in this chart here on page 34. So a 100 line means that the curve would be perfectly fat, flat across uh, the, the whole year, which is obviously not gonna happen. But anything above that indicates contango on this chart. Anything below that indicates backwardation. So we've seen ever since, uh, again, the vaccine announcement, we've seen a really uh, steep backwardation develop in the market. And that tells you traditionally that it's a tight market for crude oil. In general, historically, 75% of crude oil's gains have occurred during periods of backwardation. So this is bullish. And again, it looks, it, it, it reflects a tight market. It's calling oil out of storage and telling us we're, we're short on the uh, supply side. So we need more supply. It comes out of storage and tightens the market. This is a close up of the same indicator. You've seen we've gone from record super contango during the pandemic peak down to backwardation. And that's been a result of uh, OPEC aggressively cutting crude off the market, really not, not too much on the demand side that's helped on that. It's been OPEC doing the work. Recently, we've seen a, a trend change in oil as well. Another way we look at, at trends in, uh, at 314 is by running uh, linear regressions at different time frames and then judging the slope. On this chart, uh, we look at the 21 day, uh, the slope of the 21 day linear regression on crude oil. And you can see that we've been positive since again, the vaccine announcement just recently we've rolled over. So this is, um, I wouldn't say this is uh, outright bearish yet, but it's something to watch. You know, we could be undergoing a, a trend change in oil. I don't see a ton of downside given the fact that OPEC has removed so much oil from the market and really tightened us up here. But at the same time, uh, I, I think we're consolidating this move. And again, it's, it's gonna be difficult without true demand coming back for us to, uh, to, to climb much higher here. And you're, you're gonna see OPEC as they bring oil back on the market become increasingly antsy about getting back to a more normalized supply state because their budgets collectively can't handle uh, the low level of production and moderate prices uh, that we have right now. Finally, inventories, we've, uh, we've seen inventories uh, draw down during the, the pan post vaccine period. We have seen some uh, increase uh, in, in inventories. We look at this on a total petroleum basis. So combining crude oil and refined products, if you look only at crude oil, you're only getting part of the story. And so uh, in this chart that we're looking at, negative bars indicate inventory draws that are greater than you'd expect for a seasonally adjusted period and positive bars are the opposite. We're getting builds that are larger or, or draws that are smaller than you'd expect for that time of the year. We did get an increase in inventories that was due to uh, really the Texas freeze that we had a few weeks back. And so we're starting to get back to drawing inventories. Ultimately, it looks on an inventory perspective, like the market is tight. But all this, uh, really, it's, it's, you have to discount it. You have to discount the inventory data. You have to discount the, the physical market data. Because at the end of the day, you have this record spare capacity at OPEC. 
hanging over the market. And that's the point that, you know, I think we go back to when we're talking about inflation and spare capacity in the, in the, uh, in the slack in the economy, there's slack in the oil market. The demand side of the equation is not normalized yet. And it's going to be a while before we get back to pre-pandemic levels. So you have record OPEC spare capacity hanging over the market and, and ultimately keeping, I think, a lid on prices from going much higher when you're when you're looking at the bottom line for all this. I, I just think it's hard to get prices to move materially higher from here while there's this much spare capacity on the on the OPEC side. Um, so when you take this all in, we have a, um, a model that we put together, which is uh, we use again these four pieces of the framework we laid out positioning inventories physical market uh, and technicals and we we put that into uh, a machine learning framework which is one of the the areas that uh, our firm specializes in and we've come up with what i think is a pretty neat model this model uh, just as a side note the entire equity line is cross-validated and out of sample so everything you see here is a stitched together out of sample equity line the model's neutral right now. Really what it sees is that positioning is bearish and we have a number of um, other mildly bullish factors and that nets out to neutral. I think that makes sense. I think OPEC has control on the downside, but as I said, I don't think there's a ton of upside for oil. So if you're looking at, at it from, a, I, I don't see any reason to get extremely bullish or bearish on oil, but I also see this as giving us a green light to not have to worry about oil driving inflation expectations higher as we uh, move through the year and into next year. So my bottom lines are really that the, the transition from pandemic driven lockdowns to reopening have been just the most volatile economic backdrop in modern history. And that's really given rise to this duration heuristic that we talked about. The two big questions that we, uh, the, the issues that we face, when will inflation arise? And how do you generate income in a low interest rate environment? I think oil can help you with, with both of those. Economic slack and still impaired oil demand are, are really uh, arguing against serious inflation in the near term, serious enough to move the Fed off their, their current policy projection. And as I said, energy has become a short duration asset. I think this makes uh, gives energy an interesting place in uh, income producing portfolios. You can you can balance out all that abundant long duration exposure with some energy offsets. Currently, our oil model is neutral. That kind of reflects my view of the market as well right now. I don't see a, a, a big move coming either up or down for oil in the near term. I think we're digesting the move off of the vaccine lows and OPEC has control of the market for now. So it's going to be, we're going to digest for a little bit uh, and neutral makes the most sense. And with that, I will uh, open it up to questions. Hey, Warren, uh, thank you so much for that really in-depth uh, presentation. I'm really looking forward to the discussion that we're going to have in this next segment of the program. So let's go ahead and dive right into the Q&A because I see we've got a number of questions coming in. Uh, just as a reminder, this is an opportunity for you, the audience, uh, to ask our speaker any question about today's topic. Um, so if you'd like to submit a question at any time, just use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom webinar session. We'll try to get through as many as we can, just kind of given the constraints of time. Uh, Warren, just kind of get a house housekeeping item out of the way. Um, there was a question right off the bat regarding access to these slides here. Uh, are these slides available to the audience? And if so, um, is, there a, uh, is there a way they can, they can reach out to, to access them? Sure. Um, you know, I would say, we can uh, provide our email for company email and we'll get those out to you. And we'll, if you, if you reach out to us, we'll provide anyone who wants the deck from today. And uh, so, yes, we'll make these, we'll make this available as a PDF. Okay. Appreciate that. So uh, like I said, we'll try to get into the questions we have. We have a number of them in the queue right now. I wanted to see if we can actually um, open up this, this discussion with a poll question with your audience. I think that, and 
I, I think this is kind of a reflection of the energy sector just in general. It's been one of the most hated sectors, just given some of the other headwinds that it deals with. We are in Boston, as you know, and there's there's a sweeping motion uh, movement towards ESG. And so there's kind of this uh, desire to kind of shed, uh, you know, these fossil fuel carbon footprint type of assets. So I want to kind of get the audience's take on this, just given what you've laid out. Um, and let's see if we can run the poll question here. Let me just go ahead and show what the question is. And I'll just go ahead and run, run the poll for everyone to see it. So given the fundamental and macro backdrop for the energy sector, you expect your firm's allocation to traditional energy companies over the next 12 to 24 months to increase, increase, stay the same, or decrease. I'd be curious to kind of see what people say. So we got about a third of the people voted already, and they're coming in fast. About half of you have already voted. All right, I'll give it a few more seconds here. Almost 70% here have voted. And I, I, we do see a clear trend. So let's go ahead um, and give this five more seconds. All right, let's go ahead and share the result. And interestingly enough, most of you think it's not gonna really make a difference. 53% said it's gonna stay the same. Um, but then about almost, uh, what is it? 39% said you're gonna increase your allocation and only 8% said you're looking to decrease. So um, interesting, interesting result, Warren. Kind of curious to kind of get your take as you talk to clients uh, and, and sort of the, I know you talked about a lot of the slack that's out there and that there's still a lot of, the, work to try, to try to dig out from where oil is right now. Uh, but what is your take on these results? I mean, it's really interesting to me because I think I, I've spent, I, anyone who's in investment world spends a decent amount of time trying to, to triangulate where the consensus is. And so we, I've done the same and I do the same. Uh, and, and there's, it's hard for me to tell. I, my feeling, to be honest, is that uh, from people I encounter, there's a lot of optimism uh, around around oil and around energy, and I think it's just human nature to want to buy something that's down so much to a certain extent. And I think that's a, there is a a strong desire to do that. It makes you you know, especially given the fact that there's nothing cheap in the market right now, or very little that's cheap in the market. So, energy becomes kind of this default place to go look, and so that makes sense to me. I, and I wouldn't decrease my exposure right now, but I I think I kind of. Um, my message to clients has been, let's curb our enthusiasm. I, I don't think, for instance, I see a question that came through here uh, about commodity super cycle and oil as a super cycle. And I am not there. I don't think we're at the stage where we would call this a super cycle in oil. Um, at the end of the day, we're in, we're still an impaired market. And so we will need to see, I think, uh, in order to get there, and, and I believe we will see one just as a, as a a preview, but just the timing is everything. I think we could be a good year or 18 months away. And it could be pretty choppy in the interim because what we have is brand of this reopening demand kind of comes back. And then OPEC's going to be putting oil back on the market at that point. And they dump that all that spare capacity that I showed back on the market. And there's no telling how the market will handle that, how OPEC will manage the market, how that agreement will come together, um, how, or how what's going to happen with Iranian oil. There's a, a lot of moving parts and we're not at, with this much spare capacity and you would be foolish to jump the gun and say we're at a super cycle stage yet. Now, the other side of the coin is we're not gonna get, we haven't gotten the investment. Just look at the CapEx chart I put in there showing CapEx over the last five years. CapEx has gone off a cliff. And I think that uh, given the ESG movements and given the fact that, uh, you know, there isn't a desire for long-term growth CapEx in the invest in the investor class for energy and traditional energy. Uh, I believe that it's, uh, it's we're gonna have a shortfall of um, non-OPEC supply that hits the market once we've eaten through that excess capacity and once we have normalized demand. So on the other side of that, I believe is really high oil prices. Um, it's just a matter of timing. We're not there yet in my opinion, but in the next, you know, call it 24 months, we'll start a what I believe would be a, a pretty sharp upcycle in the price of oil. Gotcha. 
appreciate that. We got a number of questions here, so forgive us. Forgive me if I if we jump around a little bit. There's there's all kinds of topics that we're hitting on. So let's start off with the topic of dividends. Um, you know, there have been some controversy about some oil companies out there being so stubborn to maintain their dividends. And one question came in from uh, from attendee: Are oil companies using cheap debt to pay dividends? And as a follow on uh, to that question, is OPEC still essential for setting prices? Yes and yes. Uh, the for many most of the integrated oil companies at this stage, at this price of oil are using uh, they're they're funding their dividends through debt. So there, that's another factor in the the higher yield is that these maybe the market's calling saying these are not sustainable dividends. So I mean, you you need higher oil prices ultimately to bail these companies out and to bail their dividend policies out. Um, but they're still able to access cheap debt for the large for the most part. Uh, and so the, and I do believe that oil prices, as they rise, it becomes the, the dividends become more sustainable. You got to remember the downstream business on all these integrates is still really impaired too, which has not been the case for many years. You had for the most part, when upstream fell apart back like in 2016, you saw downstream carry water. And this, this is a totally different crisis as a demand driven crisis, which really kills you on the downstream and the upstream. So it's a tough environment. OPEC is absolutely essential for setting prices. I mean, we've seen them, uh, we've seen OPEC basically take control of the market and this pandemic uh, worked in their favor. So we had the price war at the initial stages of the uh, pandemic. And, and after that, they all came together and really Saudi Arabia and Russia came together and uh, squeezed the market and, and cleaned it up, which if, without that, if we were all producing just outright, I mean, you saw we had negative prices. So OPEX, absolutely essential. Okay. And there was another question just to kind of follow on. You mentioned the integrateds and we talk, we're talking about dividends. Um, are you considering integrated companies for dividends? And more broadly speaking, Warren, just to kind of, for me to piggyback on that, years ago, you wrote about the integrates in general, just kind of being inefficient plays if you're looking to allocate into energy. Instead, you should just look for high quality upstream, higher quality downstream. So um, what is your response to this question about uh, using integrates as a way to kind of fill that income gap? Um, and then do you have a, just kind of a general takeaway with integrates? Yeah, I mean, I I think the the times have changed from um, when we when I wrote that report. That was uh, I think a report in 2012. I remember writing it. So it was you know nine years ago, and so yeah, I think that what you see now is uh, an environment where size and scope of uh, of the company makes a big difference as far as access to scarce capital. Back then, you could be an upstream player and get you know access capital at, at low rates. And you didn't have the skepticism of shale in general that you have now. That was 2012. So I prefer integrated over um, independent upstream into a really independent downstream as well. Like I said, independent downstream has its own problems. And there's a lot of overcapacity there. And it's a different kind of different kind of downturn. So I think that integrated is where you want to go. Um, and you want to play that with the most conservative integrated names in and they are they are a big part of them. If you buy the energy sector, which is what we have in our income model, for instance, the energy sector is almost all integrated at this point from an S and P energy sector standpoint, just be by virtue of where the market capitalization lies. So, Chevron, I think, is the best positioned um, integrated, and Exxon's you know a little bit farther down. Okay, great. Uh, there's a question about China. It's a very brief question, but I think there's a little bit more we can add to it here. The simple question is, does China store energy? Um, now, just to kind of add to that, you've you've done some work and you've de demonstrated China's demand during this pandemic with the illustration of the uh, ESPO or ESPO premium. Um, can you kind of talk to that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, China does store energy. The bottom line is, is this is a problem that all oil analysts have to try and get around is you don't have visibility on uh, on China really as the big culprit for for their inventory data. They you, you don't get that. You get weekly data in the United States, for instance, and so you have really clean data for the U.S. inventories, but you don't get to see what China's doing. So you have to kind of triangulate it, and that's as as um, non OECD consumption kind of takes over, which it has. Uh, and dominates the the overall demand equation, that becomes a harder potential problem to solve as an oil analyst. But but uh, China, it from my view has and from things I look at, whether it's um, 
floating storage in Asia or different differentials and premiums, like you said, the ESPO pipeline going uh, Eastern Siberian pipeline, which is a, a great price point for uh, oil going into China. You can see that during the, the periods of uh, in the initial stages of the pandemic when oil was low, China looked to be uh, buying up and probably uh, hoarding crude oil during those those part portions of the pandemic. And they've kind of, if you look at those premiums, it looks like they may have backed off somewhat. And there is seasonality in the, the, the Chinese New Year and different travel uh, based uh, factors, but they seem to be strategic buyers increasingly where you get them buying on weakness and, uh, and kind of pausing their buying because they're the largest importer in the world. Pause, they're never selling really, pausing their buying on these upswings. Gotcha. There's a few policy related questions, and I know that you, you tend to focus a lot on the data, but obviously these questions tend to be on investors' minds a lot, especially given the current landscape in, in Washington, D.C. So uh, just in general, what do you what is your take on the policy initiatives of the current administration? We know that the Keystone pipeline was abruptly canceled. And what is kind of the read through on that, given kind of the push towards this this concept of the Green New Deal? The, move, the aggressive move to, towards renewables, which might more likely or not, is going to be part of the infrastructure package. Uh, can you speak a little bit to that? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that uh, the the upshot is that there's going to be less. It's a, it's a compounding factor for less investment into this traditional energy space. So when we talk about the super cycle that is to come, it's going to only get worse because of the policies that are that are in the in place right now. More present tense, it makes me more positive on Canadian energy, which when when you look around for just like we said, sustainable dividend yields, and where would you go? The the, the big Canadian energy companies have been the spots, the individual securities that I've felt comfortable recommending my clients. Uh, and I think you have to, to, those are spots that are going to continue to do well for the fact that they have um, more conservative uh, financials, the underlying um, maintenance capex that's needed to, to keep those operations going is less than your shale operations. Shale has such a steep decline curve that you have to continue to pour money into those wells in order to um, produce. And so, you know, I think the Canadian guys, this is just another tailwind to them as you kind of push capital into those names as opposed to U.S. names. But on a macro, from a macro perspective, I think it it just makes the coming price spike that much more dramatic uh, when we get there. Interesting. Going back to your discussion on inflation, you had a chart in your deck that showed the linkage between inflation and oil. Uh, there was a question that came from a, an attendee that said, uh, are you saying that oil follows inflation or inflation follows oil? I'm saying inflation follows oil. So oil is pushing the inflation numbers higher and, and inflation expectations specifically follow oil. Uh, as oil goes up, you've seen a historic linkage between inflation expectations and oil. So the next step of thinking is, well, we have 5 million barrels a day of excess capacity left from uh, pre-pandemic levels, does it make sense to, you know, start calling for hyperinflation in that environment? No, I don't think so. And that's the big, the big takeaway macro wise. Gotcha. Appreciate all the questions coming in from the audience. Uh, these are really great questions. I'm just trying to make the most out of the time here and, and appreciate you, Warren, sticking around uh, as we go through these. There's been a number of questions about EVs and the influence on the demand for, for oil just more broadly. And I think the best way to kind of tackle this subject is with this question here um, coming from an audience member. Any top-down thoughts on the metals complex, for example, base metals like copper, tin, iron, ore? Um, but, you know, we would include in that, of course, I, I would also include in that um, what's essential for the renewable space. So you know, would you like to add some comments to that? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that the... Uh, the I, the, the outlook for copper is is pretty strong, and I mean, it, it is a. Are we going to move forward? I think that the the election is has basically been a mandate. Are we going to be a copper based future economy or an oil based future economy? And I think the answer is clear. It's going to be more of a copper based future economy. Uh, electric vehicles on uh, have carry four times the copper of a traditional ICE vehicle. It's going to be a the the you know 
you can get into nooks and crannies of what commodities are going to be at different points in the new green economy. But copper is central to many of the things that we're going to be doing in the green economy. And oils is quite frankly not. But at the same time, that's what makes oil an interesting part of your, your portfolio is it's being let, like you said at the beginning, it is being left for dead. And if you're selective with your times going in there and where you're adding into your portfolio, it serves a different purpose, you know, and we're not going to, we can try all we want to, and we can incentivize electric vehicles and we can re, we can green the grid and green buildings. But at the end of the day, this is an oil based, uh, petroleum based uh, economy, and we're not going to make that transition overnight. I don't believe that um, oil demand has peaked yet globally. And, and so, you know, ultimately, uh, copper as a secular play, I think, makes more sense when you're looking at it from how, what are we going to incentivize as a society and where is the growth going to go? But, but oil is, is going to be with us for still some time. And just by extension from that, when you're being, being that you're more bullish on copper longer term, this, this should bode well for emerging markets, you would say? Uh, yeah, I would say I would say so. Yeah, I mean, I think that there's um, that that that's uh, to a certain extent. I don't know how strong that relationship would be, but yeah, I mean, it, 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 to the extent that you have, um, yeah, I guess I would, that would be one way to say it. Okay, great. Um, you mentioned Chevron earlier. Uh, Buffett made an investment in that. Any thoughts on that investment? <laughs> it's hard. It's hard to kind of read the Oracle of Omaha at times. But uh, what, what's your thought on that? I think he's picking the right oil companies. He had some Suncor and some Chevron. I think he's picking the right oil companies. Um, and so I think that, uh, you know, that it's, in my opinion, my, it's my favorite integrated, uh, domestic integrated oil play. And so, you know, I think that uh, makes sense. If you're going to plug in a single uh, big energy stock, Chevron's not a bad place to go. It has some good has Permian exposure and uh, some LNG exposure as well. And so it's like, again, it's, it's you know, conservatively managed uh, comparatively, um, all things I like. Gotcha. We had a question just kind of, uh, just going back to your outlook on oil. So given what you, that you expect oil prices to increase much higher in a 24 month time frame, is it still your opinion that inflation would not go higher in two to three years? I think that, well, to, to make it very clear, 24 months is when we could start talking about a true super cycle beginning. That's, that's what I mean by that, is that we, we need to cut through this period where we actually work through the excess capacity before we get to that place of liftoff, right? And so how we, where, what price we're at when we get there is still gonna be a function of how OPEC manages that excess capacity. And so, it's just premature. 24 months from now, we can start talking about a super cycle, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. um, and so at, at that point, then you've got to go out from that point to say, here's where uh, prices start getting really hot. And so you, you could be three years away before you start seeing, you know, a lot higher prices. And, you know, inflation at that point, yeah. But I, my, what I'm looking at is break-even rates. So we're talking about kind of it's a it's a time frame issue here we're looking on the charts in the, in the presentation break even rates at today's point looking out to that point and you, i don't see a path for getting us to a place on the two-year break even or even the five-year break even anytime soon that makes a really changes the path for the fed when you look at that trend line for two percent uh price increases and so yeah i, I I think it'll be a totally different conversation that we're having three years from now, but today it would make sense, no sense to adjust your portfolio today uh, based on a potential inflation outlook. And I don't think the concerns for inflation we're hearing or that I'm addressing are for near-term inflation. It's they're, they're, or they're for near-term inflation, not four or five years from now, which that's a, no one can see four or five years in the future. Gotcha. So, Maybe we can kind of dive a little bit into the sector. You know, there's different various plays within within the space. And one of the bright spots actually last year when oil took a nosedive was the tankers. Just given the steep contango, the incentivization to look for a place to store that oil because it was just not worth trying to sell it at the current spot price. Um, seemingly, uh, it was almost seems like overnight that the... Um, the prospects kind of evaporated those windfall prospects so what is your latest take on the economics for the oil tankers yeah well back then we had super contango so you had 
extremely high um, tanker rates based off of storage of crude oil. So you have like a barbell here for tankers where you have really bad market where you have super contango that incentivizes and makes economic storing floating storage. So floating oil inventories. And that's where we were at when we had the highest, the, the steepest contango on record. So that, you know, flowed through to shipping rates. Now, because OPEC cut back on supply, it was less supplied. And what it does is it normalizes the market. So in a normal market, what drives tankers is ton mileage, which is ultimately a function of demand. Demand is still at 95 million barrels a day. So if you want to get long tankers, you need to really have a strong belief that global demand is going back to where it was. Because we have a tanker fleet that's built, just like everything in the industry is built for a hundred million barrel a day world, basically, we're at 95. So excess capacity. Do you wanna be long tankers when you have this much excess capacity in the market? The super contango play, floating storage play is not coming back. That's gone for the cycle and we won't see it again. So you now are at the place where you want to play tankers, you're playing an economic recovery, a ton mileage recovery, a demand recovery. Um, and that's a totally different bet. I don't want to make it. It's not something I'm interested in right now, um, personally, but that's the basic, that's the difference. Then it's a very big difference between from last year to this year. Gotcha. By the way, there was a quick question on um, whether or not this presentation will be recorded. Yes, there will be a recording of this presentation made available shortly after uh, we're finished. Um, we give it a you know a week or so. We'll try to get that up uh, and and avail made available to the audience. So um, there's been a number of questions on ESG, and again, appreciate uh, everyone just kind of uh, sending in the questions. Just trying to move through these as fast as we can. And, and Warren, again, appreciate the, the the time you're putting in here. We've got a little bit of time left. Um, how do you account for changing evaluation of oil in portfolios with ESG and green regulatory oversight aversion to carbon? Uh, there's been more of an ESG lens. I think you actually mentioned that some of the Canadian names uh, that you looked at have higher ESG scores relative to um, their, their peers. Um, what is your thoughts on that? I'm not 100% sure I understand the question. Um, but yeah, I mean, ESG is, is obviously... I look at it, I don't know if this answers it or not, but when I think of ESG and in energy, I, I'm looking at it as, you know, how do you access different pools of capital? And ESG is increasingly a, um, a block for certain energy companies to access that very, you know, scarce capital for the industry. And so to the extent you can, like a Canadian oil companies have made efforts to become more ESG friendly, they might be able to make it into some of those portfolios and access that capital um, you know, better, at least in their domestic U United States counterparts. But ultimately what it does to me, what it tells me is if you lock up more capital in ESG and if, if by definition oil is not ESG compliant, then you're going to need higher rates of, you're, you're gonna have to incent more capital through higher dividend yields and rates of return. So we're in this, in my view, there's a kind of a, a bit of a, a transition taking place in the investor base of these energy companies. And that's due to this kind of like, well, we're in ESG now, or we need to have some kind of ESG overlay on our capital. So therefore we can't be with you. So now you need new capital to come in there. And that capital is going to be, I believe, income seeking capital. The big loser in all this is the long-term growth projects, which is where you go back to when we talk three years down the road, two years down the road, and we start talking about a new super cycle for crude oil. Gotcha. Okay, great. Uh, there is a question about oil and energy demand. So here's the question. It's a little bit, uh, takes a little bit of time to go through here. Will the demand for oil and energy drive in the opposite direction? Since the last few years, there has been more emphasis and effort to build electric vehicles and other forms of carbon-free solution. So will the consumption of oil decrease while the consumption of energy increase? Consumption of oil I mean, I think this is a way of saying, like, will oil become a less prominent aspect of our overall energy mix? Um, yeah, I believe so, but it's a transportation fuel still. Oil is a transportation fuel. Um, so, you know, you're going to need to see less of a transition on the, the grid side and more of a transition on the, the from, uh, from ICE vehicles to EV vehicles in order to make a real dent in oils uh, overall. Uh, position in the uh, in the 
in the energy mix. So yeah, I think at the margin, you'll see that, but I'm not, I don't think that's like uh, gonna happen anytime soon. There's so many different, um, there are so many different unintended consequences that come if you were gonna make a big push for, you know, for EV dominance, let's say, we'll find out, like we talked about with copper, what that does to different, the prices of different base metals. And, uh, you know, there'll be problems that, that crop up along that path as well. So, you know, I, I think that the, the, the short answer is yes, oil will be increasingly less prominent in our overall energy mix, but it's not going to be this off a cliff dramatic move um, lower. Gotcha. There's some other questions here about OPEC and whether they're behind the curve or ahead of the curve. I also would like to add to that. You've done some work on just kind of the geopolitics associated with the price of oil that's needed to kind of sustain the budgets, particularly for the King kingdom of Saudi Arabia. So I was wondering if you can kind of touch on this, this question about, you know, OPEC's influence more particularly. So you talked about the spare capacity, you talked about the, the tightening supply just it kind of seems more of a, a short-term thing, but is there a point where they're going to kind of lose control just because they cannot sustain the, the budgetary shortfalls? Um, I mean, I, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts on, on, on Saudi Arabia's influence on this and also kind of also thinking about uh, Saudi Arabia versus Russia in terms of who's got the stronger financial footing. Yeah, I mean, it's all, but something that's been coming for a while. I wrote, been writing about it for years of the Saudi versus Russia. You know, and it's Russia is in the money on their their crude oil right now. So their budget breaks even below where Brent's trading today. Whereas the Saudis need to move Brent crude oil up to about $90 a barrel in order to break their, the, to break their balance, their budget. Now, in order to just fund the budget, they need crude oil to increase by probably another $15 a barrel from where it's at. And so either way, however you slice it, the, the Saudi Arabia is behind the curve here. And so it's a spot I've looked at for years. It was something I predicted coming into this was that we were gonna see the Saudis carry the water on most of these cuts, which has been the case. So we had, and this is why oil rallied after the vaccine, initial vaccine bump was, Saudis cut in January, Saudis cut in February, Saudis cut in March, Saudis cut in April. They hold these cuts in place for four months and they're all unilateral cuts, no other participants. So that shows you who's most concerned with making sure the propping up the price of oil and needing it for their budget. Um, so that's been on the, the shoulders of the Saudis. And now we're transitioning into the part where OPEC is starting to release oil back onto the market. That's starting in May. So I think the there's a lot of like, let's wait and see kind of attitude in the oil market to see what that does to prices. But the bottom line is, like I said, the, the Russians are, you know, probably fine with where oil prices are at right now. Their budget's fine, whereas Saudis need substantially higher prices from here. And that creates uh, an inherent friction within the OPEC plus group. Uh, and that's been playing out for years and played out during really in most dramatic fashion during the initial price war in March of last year, which caused prices to go negative and nobody wanted that. So um, those dynamics aren't going away, but ultimately Saudis are, are the losers. Um, and I'm not, I would be very uh, bearish on Saudi long-term. They're gonna have to do some real, um, they're gonna have to do some crazy transitions on their economy in order to um, keep the standard of living the same going out, you know, in the next, you know, 10 years or so. So it's a long play, but not not very optimistic on that that gotcha. situation appreciate that no this is this is great information we've got a few minutes left so i'll try to be rapid here so we have a question on do you see increase an increase in bankruptcy in shale oil companies and warren one other thing i would like to add to is that we haven't really touched on any of the midstream name the pipeline companies much um they are a major you'll you know when you think about when you look across the energy space they have pretty high yields there so i'd like to get your thoughts on that but let's first talk, touch on the bankruptcies in the sales space um so what are your thoughts on that i think the most part the, the bankruptcies are are over because uh, you know as long as the oil prices don't collapse we don't have something i don't foresee in the macro economy i think the macro economy is strengthening going forward we're going to be ultimately these cyclicals including um, energy stocks are going to be in a position to have with a tailwind. So we're not going to be going through another bankruptcy cycle anytime soon. So I think we're pretty much out of the woods on that. There'll be some idiosyncratic um, 
situations where you do get, you know, some shale place folding up, but, you know, I think uh, for the most part that we're through that. So no, I don't think we're going to get a big wave of bankruptcies there right now. Um, as far as the, what was the second question about MLP? Uh, just your general thoughts on the midstream MLPs, pipeline uh, companies. Yeah. I mean, again, pipelines are, there's kind of, you're kind of an overcapacity. I like Williams as a, as a pipeline play, mm -hmm. uh, but that's a natural gas pipeline play. They have some assets that, I mean, you'll never duplicate. They have the Transco system that basically serves the entire Northeastern United States, all Eastern seaboard of the United States for natural gas. And uh, they do have some gathering and processing um, kind of crappier assets in that, in that mix. But ultimately I think like a company like Williams is, you know, you're getting a 7% dividend yield and it looks really attractive to me. And natural gas is, is, is not impaired like the oil market where everything else, all the other MLPs, you know, you're dealing with significantly lower production in the United States for now, you know, and I don't see, again, the capital, the, the commitment from investors is not there to grow that production or to fund the growth of that production anymore. So MLPs are ultimately negatively impacted by that. They're priced for the, the large high quality ones are priced at a decent spot right now. So you're not probably going to get hurt too bad on them. But again, I'm not, I don't see the yields going back to where they were, you know, years ago. I don't see like enterprises yield going back to where it was any time in the near future. Uh, there's just too much over, over capacity for now, maybe many years down the road, but not right now in the near term. Gotcha. All right, we got a few minutes left. So um, real quickly, just uh, quick thoughts on ETFs that people um, are, that are potential plays, like recommendations that you have that are ETFs. I would just do, you know, the problem with, I wish I had better answers. XLE is your best bet. You're going to just get a lot of integrated exposure and, and overall energy sector exposure in XLE, but it's costs are generally low. OIH, I saw someone mention that. That's oil field services this is not where I want to park all my capital in this environment. Um, XOP is supposed to be producers, but it has a lot of refiners in there as well. So, I mean, the ETF mix in the energy space is suboptimal. XLE is where I'd go just for lower cost and broad uh, exposure to the industry. So just to recap, just kind of you were kind of, um, uh, prioritize this, this uh, the you know, sub industries, what would be your top pick and what would be your, your least pick? What, like what would be at the top? What would be at the bottom? Uh, large, high quality producers. The top okay. of this of that heap is, like I said, large Canadian producers, um, C and Q, SU, um, and then on domestically, I would move down to the integrateds and the large integrateds. I think in this environment where you're kind of still waiting out this this impaired market stage, you know, large. And access to capital wins the day. And that's what you, you know, those guys are going to consolidate over time. It's going to be a slow churn, but that's where I would go. Final of that, if you're trying to play a reopening type of stage of the stock market, um, I think overall refiners, it's been a space I spent a lot of time on. I recommended it for many years. I did like it a lot for many years. You probably get still some boost out of this reopening on refiners because you're tip of the demand spear there. But at the end of the day, that's still still kind of an impaired group so i would look large i would look up north to canada that would be my top uh, and my least favorite would be um small cap uh, shale players i i think you know unless you have some edge on the geology there and have a, a good idea of um, the underlying assets then you should just stay away from that group sounds good appreciate that Warren, we've pretty much come to the end of time here. So I want to uh, express on behalf of the society and our members, you know, thank you so much for taking the time uh, for putting this presentation together. That, that was just an excellent slide deck. And thanks to the audience as well um, for, for the questions. These are a lot of great questions that came through. Before we uh, sign off for today, any any final parting comments you'd like to, to provide to the audience? Uh, not really, just to say that, um... Appreciate everybody giving me the, the opportunity. You give me the opportunity to speak here. And uh, if you have any interest, 314 Research, we're, we're more than just an oil shop. We do we look at the entire macro picture and then try and solve the, the, the big questions using um, advanced quantitative techniques. So I'd encourage anyone who's interested to check us out. Great, thank you so much. Uh, thanks again, and, and thanks to everyone for attending today's presentation. Uh, remember to visit our website, cfaboston.org to see our upcoming events.
in the meantime, until we meet again, uh, please be well and take care.